45, 40, run, William, run! He's got blockers in front, five, touchdown! Joshua Crib! He snapped back, ball down, can't block. block! They blocked the kick! This is the Orange is Orange Browns podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm your host, Shay Smith, and with me, as always, Browns insider, Jeremy Powell. Jeremy, the Browns, <laughs> they have fired John Dorsey. What is going on in Berea? I feel like I'm in my element because I feel like if there's one thing that Browns fans, Browns podcasters, Browns media knows, it's GM searches and coach searches, right? So I feel at home. I'm ready to roll. This feels like normal to me. This is normalcy. Let's get it going, Chase. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Browns fans, I, I, I'm, I'm 100% convinced Browns fans love the drama. They may get on social media and scream about it and yell about it and blah, blah, blah. They love this. You can't – you cannot not – a little part of you has to love – you know the whole people love to watch the world burn thing? There's at least a little part of everybody that kind of likes this, you know, this uh, drama and the chaos and, you know, all of that. So, I mean, there's some fun to it, Chase, but let's, let's get down to business here. A, a year ago, almost uh, 20, 20 days away, Seth Wickersham released a – incredible Browns expose detailing the dysfunction detailing how the Browns (laughs) just Browns themselves out of every situation out of every possibility and Jeremy the more things change the more they stay the same here we are once again in January reports of um, assistant coaches telling other teams how bad oh yeah by the way how we were on the we were on the cutting edge of that one weren't we with the Todd Munkin thing now everybody knows about it Landry coming out saying that I mean it's just what did Landry say Landry was like Freddie only cared about running certain plays and not oh no no yeah some type of yeah um, I I actually was tweeting that as it was happening you're talking about his end of year presser what he was saying is Freddie cared more about plays than players as in Freddie wanted to plug players into his plays and not use the strength of players to his advantages And, and he said that Freddie did not know how to game plan against other teams' weaknesses. And those two things right there are how you win in the NFL because everybody's good, right? Everybody's good. You just got to find the spot where you're a little better and take advantage of it. And he essentially said Freddie did not know how to do that. And now from what we're hearing, you know how we talked about all season long about how the Browns were great in the first drive and horrible after that. That makes so much sense now to hear what Todd Munkin is saying because the beginning of the game was scripts. Todd Munkin told other teams' coaches that Freddie did not know how to call plays, right? Yeah. Well, his first series of every game would have been scripted. So Todd would have – he probably would have actually listened to Todd on that portion of it. And then as the game went on, Freddie could not call plays in the game, which goes right along with his – Poor situational awareness, right? He did not have good awareness of what was going on in the games. And that's pretty much been confirmed now. There, there were whispers that uh, Dorsey's job was on the hot seat as well. It was hard to believe because of just all of the dysfunction. Like, what? Well, it's actually not hard to believe. But uh, when Dorsey's presser got pushed back, uh, that's yeah. when, at least for me, I was the like, red oh, flags went off. <laughs> this is like, yeah. this is for real. Um, and then you start looking at the – and we're going to talk about this here in a little bit, Jeremy. I want to first spend time talking about the Haslam's. But then you start hearing about the possibilities of who the head coach is and that they yeah. come with a clause that they have to be working with this guy. And then all of a sudden, Paul D. Podesta is back in the news. Anytime uh, Paul D. Podesta, chief strategist, is trending as much as Paul D. Podesta has, like he's got to be the most well-known position in any franchise of whatever position he holds. <laughs> like, right? I mean, right. yeah, no one should know his position name in any – Unless you're a diehard. But well, this is so funny. It's so funny because like I, I've talked about this. I'm sure you've seen on Twitter the last couple of days trying to explain this to people. D Podesta is the chief strategy officer. And it's funny when you listen to guys like Rizzo, old school guys and Grossi, they don't have any idea what a chief strategy officer is. It's a common thing now. Okay. Businesses have chief strategy. Like big businesses, corporations have CSOs, right? Chief strategy officers. Because everybody in every big business uses the analytics now. And they have pro- – and part of what D Podesta does is set up the processes to which the organization uses to make decisions. All big businesses have this now. So when I hear people say – when they said that, oh, he's in charge of the coaching search, he's going to – no. He's in charge of the process of the coaching search. He's setting up the candidates. He's setting up the questions. 
and then he will present the candidates, present the process to the owners to make the decision. That's how it works. And the, anybody in the NFL, anybody who follows the NFL, anybody who covers the NFL knows the owners always have the final decision on the coach. It doesn't matter what the setup is. Every owner in the NFL, all 32 teams, their owner has the final say on the coach. That's just how it is. So Paul, Paul De Podesta being in charge of the coaching search does not mean that he's making the decision. It means he is setting up the process. He's setting up the candidates. He's setting up the questions. He's setting up the interviews. And then they'll probably be, it looks like Elliot Wolf has survived this. It'll probably be him and Elliot Wolf and, and JW and, and D and Jimmy and probably a couple people that we don't know will be in the meetings listening and going through comprehensively each thing. Chase, I want to circle back to one thing though. You know, we were all shocked, surprised when Dorsey was fired. Right? But if you really go back and look, and then you go back and look to the reasons they say he was let go in Kansas City. They said he, there was a communication issues, right? He wasn't always – they didn't always communicate well within the organization. Uh, there was structural issues inside the organization. That's exactly what was starting to happen here. So I do not blame Jimmy for wanting him to take a lesser role or a different role. Because look at – if you go back and really look at some of the stuff, some of the, the Callaway stuff, you know, there was so much uh, organizational stuff that happened this year. That at least part of it was Dorsey's fault, you know. It wasn't just the Freddie Kitchens thing. So I'm not surprised at all that he's gone. I, I, I mean, I wish he would have stayed, but I understand why they did it. And obviously, John, and maybe you remember how last year too, the people, the anti-Freddie people, which there wasn't, there's a whole lot of uh, revisionist history going on. There was not a whole sure. lot of anti-Freddie Kitchen people last year at the time. Now a lot of people are pretending like they were. But if you remember. One of the arguments people used was that the reason they were hiring Freddie is because John did not want another strong head coach because he had dealt uh, with Andy Reid and lost. And so that John wanted a coach that he was clearly superior to. Maybe there really was something to that, right? Maybe. Hindsight being twenty twenty, And now, so they tell, I'm sure Jimmy, they met for 48 hours. I'm sure Jimmy said to John, look, you know, we're going to bring in a coach. We're going to give him a lot of power. You're probably going to have to, you know, take a little lesser role and John obviously was not willing to do that well it's clear that analytics has ruled the day in Berea uh John Dorsey an uh, old school football guy um it is out and it's clear that there's an analytical approach moving forward Jeremy um, I, I I disagree with you a little bit yes I think that the, I think the new co head coach unless it's McCarthy which I don't I don't think it's gonna be McCarthy to be honest with you is gonna be younger and we all know that McDaniels and the Patriots use analytics. We know Stefanski is an analytics guy. Uh, I'm sure Salai, I don't know enough about Salai for, from uh, San Francisco to know, but I'm sure there's some analytics going on there. But I don't think that Deep Podesta is going to be involved in football. That's what I'm trying to say about this whole thing. I think that he is going to help them hire the coach. And this is what Mary Kay has confirmed this, but they're going to hire the coach. The coach is going to find his personnel people to put them in place. They're going to report straight to Haslam. And Deep Podesta is going to still be on the other end offering help on the analytics side, you know, running the systems, running stuff like that on the non-football side of the business. I think that's what's going on. And so I don't think he, I, he, I, look, he is not going to be running football. Depot is not going to be the, the football people that they hire are not going to report to Depot. So I don't think, I think that's been a little misrepresented in the press. Depot is not going to be the boss of the coach and the GM. But I agree with you that analytics are going to be used uh, a lot more going forward than they are right now. So let, let me ask you this. I, I want to keep talking sure. about the Haslam soon because I think this speaks to a larger deal uh, with the Haslam's listening to outside input and not sticking true. Although I don't blame them for moving on from kitchens. I scratch my head a little bit about the Dorsey uh, move, but if they have a, a behind the table agreement with Daniels and McCarthy that, Hey, like they, this is what they need to do. Then, the, sure. the reading Dorsey's statement kind of lends itself to that. Why are we okay with the 49ers defensive coordinator or Stefanski or even like Matt Rule if we want someone with head coaching experience? I feel like at oh, least Rule turns on. Brown's yeah. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, he, he declined the interview. But still, why are they entertaining those players aside from due diligence um, if we want someone? Well, you have to have a contingency plan. Experience? You have to have a contingency plan. I mean, say what if they think they have McDaniels and it falls apart like with Lombardi and Harbaugh? You know, you have to do your due diligence just in case. So you talk to those guys. I don't even know when they can interview uh, McDaniels, depending on what happens with them. They play Saturday, right? I think league rules yeah. say they can interview him Sunday, actually, if they win. If they lose, it doesn't matter. 
And I think they might lose, actually, but that's another story. Um, but if they win, I think they can interview him Sunday. So I imagine that'll happen. The rumors are they're interviewing – well, we know this confirmed that they're interviewing McCarthy tomorrow. Then I guess they're going to hop on a jet, and they're going to go out to San Francisco yeah. to uh, interview him on Friday, so on Friday. And then they probably have McDaniel Sunday. At that point, if it went well, they can't hire McDaniels, but they can say it's your job. He can agree. And then after the – playoffs are done with the Patriots they can hire him and they'll have their Rooney roll stuff out of the way of Soleil so very interesting very interesting indeed so um, but go ahead do you see the Haslam's as a problem moving forward or is this I, I think at service level this looks like the same old dysfunction the same old sure. Haslam's getting in the way do you see that being true um, I mean, you, at this point, you cannot say they're the part of the problem. At least, probably the biggest part of the problem is them. But I think once they get it going, I don't think Jimmy wants to meddle. I think he just wants it to run. It's just not running how he wants it to run. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think if they do get the right people in place, I think if you hire Josh McDaniels and they go 11 and five next year and 10 and six year after that and 10 and six year after that, you'll never hear from Jimmy again. Yeah, I think he'll be he'll be like Robert Kraft up in the you know the only time you'll see him is when they pan up to him during the games, right? I mean, that's the last, I think that's what he wants. It's just harder to get to than he probably anticipated. So if he can get the right people in place, I, I mean, I know that it's not popular and a lot of people don't like the games. I think that's the right group. I think those guys are the right group. They've been around winners. They know how to win. The Patriots have never won a Super Bowl without Josh McDaniels on the staff. Did you know that? They did not win when he left. Hmm. Every Super Bowl they've ever won, Josh McDaniels has been on that staff. Here's one for you. Cesario and Ziegler, right? The three of them all went to uh, – he's the, the – Ziegler's the player personnel guy. Uh, Cesario's the GM. And McDaniel's the offensive coordinator, right? They're all college buddies. Played college football together John Carroll, right? Yeah. If the Patriots didn't think incredibly highly of McDaniel's, would they have two of his college buddies in the three most prominent – two of the three most prominent positions in the front office? Yeah. So, obviously, they think incredibly high of Josh McDaniel's, right? Mm -hmm. They have these guys running the show. So, I – 10 years now he's been back. He's been 10 years since he blew his first chance where he was power hungry and all that. So whatever was going on as a 33 year old, I can tell you, God, I'm 38, 10 years ago, my goodness, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. I remember I'm where I was and I watched that Broncos Steelers playoff game and I yeah, threw that overtime pass. And I was so freaking pumped. I remember exactly where I was. You remember, <laughs> you remember who he threw it to? Uh, Demarius Thomas who's still playing. Right. Isn't that crazy? But uh, yeah, Demarius taught me too. Cause I love Tebow. I'm sure you love Tebow as well. I just and, wanted uh, the Steelers to lose. I, was, I know it felt yeah, weird for Tebow. the Broncos, but I cared more about Steelers. Losing. I loved that was Tebow like the last ride. Palomalu, all those bums. That was the, yeah, that was, that was great. That was uh that was fantastic. But yeah. That was 10 years ago now. Oh my goodness. And you know, I know a lot between 33 and 43. I know that I'm going to be 39. And I know when I was 29, Wait, it's yeah. a whole world of difference. I want to dump a bucket years. of cold water on the McDaniels talk. Now, I want to talk that in a, in a bit when we talk about other coaching possibilities. Let's do a Dorsey yeah. report card, Jeremy, because uh, he has quite the list of accomplishments just in about uh, 18 months or so on the job. It's not even been, <laughs> it's not even been that long. Um, what, what has been Dorsey's greatest move, his, his legacy for the Browns, Jeremy? What will John Dorsey's legacy well, be? If Baker Mayfield pans out, and I think we're back to saying, I think we're back to saying if if Baker Mayfield pans out, if Baker Mayfield is the franchise quarterback, that'll be Dorsey's biggest accomplishment. Obviously, uh, I'm buying you know, everyone's Baker stock. I, I'm I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. We heard, I've heard. <laughs> I don't know where you buy the stock, and I'm not 100 percent sure where you sell that stock, but I get you. But and I still like Baker. I'm not. I have not left the Baker. I think Baker's a good player still. And you could see it out there. Just if the dysfunction was as bad as they say, maybe the fact that they won six games and, you know, and they put up the numbers they did at times says something. But Baker and drafting Baker and Nick Chubb, it looks like Nick Chubb's obviously a cornerstone of the franchise. So if it works out going forward and they're good, that's what, you know, you can always, Dorsey can always hang hit the hat on the fact that he drafted the cornerstones of a Browns franchise that turned it around, right? He, he drafted um, Denzel Ward. Um, drafted Denzel Ward, traded for – signed Landry, traded for Beckham, right? I mean, they, they, they sort of traded for Landry, but really they traded for a franchise tag player, so it's pretty much a signing. Yeah. But, I so, mean, and, and I love Landry, and I think Landry, you know, has proven all his doubters in this city wrong. I mean, Landry is the heart and soul of the team. I agree. Uh, he's the emotional leader of the team, and he's produced on the field. So here, here's 
here's my my zig to that zag and that's that, that is all true and that is quite a resume he's going to get another job somewhere because I, I i don't think he's done that bad of a job why the hell jay would you put your entire gm stock on freddie effin kitchens i think that is a bigger legacy than any of those moves he made putting all of I'll, I'll, maybe he didn't think – maybe he thought he had this year of free. Maybe he thought he had this immunity necklace. I, I don't know what he thought, but putting all your stock in Freddie Kitchens, dude, like that's more of a head-scratcher than anything. Those were easy picks. It's easy to pick Baker. It's easy to pick Denzel Ward for. It's easy to – like those are no-brainers. What, what the – like legacy – why on earth Dorsey's forever going to be tied to Freddie Kitchens? You cannot – like they are forever linked in Brown's lore. Yeah. That I think is his yeah. legacy more than anything. Well, we'll see. Going, I mean, if if the Browns start winning next year, say Freddie Kitchens will be forgotten very quick. Um, but also, so will John Dorsey. Because if the Browns start winning right away, and it's say it's Josh McDaniels and his crew comes in, uh, um, they'll automatically get all the credit, right? So we probably won't even in three <laughs> well, years. Yeah, because that's how Dorsey set him up. Right, but in three years from now, no one's going to give a sh- flying. You know what? about Dorsey or anybody else, all they're going to care about is we're winning now, right? So what will his legacy be? If we're good, it'll probably be forgotten. Why Why did <laughs> uh, Ron Rivera take the Redskins job so quick? This job is infinitely more attractive than the Redskins, than any other job in the NFL. Well, you know what? I think they'd already started the process. Maybe, you know, you, the old saying, one in the hands worth two in the bush. He just wanted to get it done, get it handled, and, you know, start running. He didn't want to wait around to see. He knew that I mean, he was wanted there. They got aggressive with him, brought him in, and got it done fast. I mean, there's not a that. bunch of, yeah. there's not a ton of jobs open this year, no, right? Less than no. normal. Yeah. But there are three right now, and maybe Dallas, but Dallas still isn't open because Jerry Jones has like separation anxiety, I guess, with Jason Gary and doesn't want to let him go. Oh my gosh. His, his contract actually expired today. So he wouldn't even officially be fired if they don't bring him back. He would just not be renewed. <laughs> oh, did we not tell you that we changed the locks? Oh, I am so sorry. Oh, so, yeah. my gosh. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> so, technically, he wouldn't even you, be fired. Did you not get the went. memo? Oh, my but, gosh. I mean, that's, that's Jason Garrett. <laughs> that really is a strange situation, isn't it? They've met for, like, Dude. three days and came to no resolution on the future. So, anyway, so right now you have three jobs open, us, the Panthers, and the, Panthers and the Giants. The Giants are have a – Gettleman's the GM. They've already said he's going to be back. So that job is not going to be as attractive to someone who wants to have some say in something, right? So that's probably mm-hmm. going to end up being coordinator guy, first-time coach guy, you know, hot, one of those type of deals. It's probably not going to be McDaniels. All right. Well, all right, jo- all right, this all right, job all right. or Carolina? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So uh, before we go to head coaching possibilities, I want to talk about that because you can't talk about the GM filling without the head coaching possibilities. Uh, sure. Dorsey report card, A through F. Jay, what do you give John Dorsey? I'm going to give him a C. I think that's fair. Mm-hmm. I think he did some really good things. I, but I'm starting to think maybe I was a little wrong when I said the most important thing was talent. I think in, in system and talent, you know, combined, as I kept saying, maybe there was a team building aspect mm-hmm. of certain pieces in certain places that John Dorsey did not hit on. Clearly, he brought in the most talent we've had in a long time. So you got to give him credit for that. And then you got to give him negative, some negative marks because, you know, the one thing we were all leery about, and we did talk about this very early on, was – especially once they traded for Odell Beckham Jr., could Freddie handle managing all these egos? And I think the obvious answer to that is no. You know, and so I, Dorsey has to take some responsibility for that. I mean, from all reports, Dorsey was the one that pulled for Freddie. Um, you know, he was, he was the guy that wanted Freddie. And, you know, Ian Rappaport reported, I don't know if you saw it, that part of the reason John Dorsey's gone is he wanted to keep Freddie another year. So. So, I, uh, in, in doing our season long five hot minutes, it's, it's fascinating once again, Jeremy, to hear yeah. the up and down roller coaster of emotion, all that uh, has happened. Um, and, and I think that that falls on Freddie and Dorsey. I think um, it negated all of the good that he tried to do. Um, and I, I feel like C is probably where it should be. I feel like it's a cop out because that's not really saying good or bad. I'm gonna give him a D, yeah. Jay. Uh, especially if he more was more bad than good. Clamoring for Kitchens to be back, it's indefensible. Um, now that's coming from Ian Rapport, and who knows who's telling him that? But it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Of course, he's gonna want his coach if it was his pick. Yeah. To get uh, to get another year chance to prove himself. 
But like we said, you just can't be worse at the end of the season than you were at the beginning of the season as a rookie head coach and make it. So uh, let's talk about the future of the Browns because that's what we're good at. Uh, let's dream together. Let's build this optimism. Let's drive this train, Jay, uh, into 2020, a new decade. My God, the last decade couldn't have gone really any worse for Browns fans. What are the possibilities for the Browns? You can't talk about a Browns head coach without a Browns GM. Jay, enlighten us. What do we have to look forward to over this next week or so? Or what do we, what do we see here? Well, I don't agree with, you know, I know a lot of people are already back to the, no one's going to want to work here. I disagree. It's 32 jobs. There's only really three, maybe four open right now in the league. They're going to get a, a solid candidate. Um, I, what, what do we have to look forward to? A lot of stories, a lot of leaks. It looks like the Haslam's are back using Mary Kay as their uh, spin doctor again, dropping stories with her. So we're going to have some interesting selective leaks from her. Look to her when you want to find out what the ownership's thinking compared to what other people are saying. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. I, I, I'm interested in Salah, the guy from San Francisco, to see if he – I think he's an actual candidate. I think McDaniels is the leading candidate. I'm worried about McCarthy. Let me tell you why I'm worried about McCarthy. He put – you know how they showed the video of him. He already built his staff and stuff while he was waiting. Yeah. and learn. Now, I think this could be part of the reason Carolina is balking at him. His, his offensive coordinator is Jim Haslett. Jim Haslett hasn't coached in the league in, since 2014. His defensive coordinator, his name just escaped me, but he hasn't coached in the league since 2015. So you got uh, some older guys who have not coached in the league together, and they're, they're, uh, and this is a package deal. So Carolina was reported there. I knew they had interviewed him once. It turns out they've interviewed him twice now, and he still hasn't been hired there, and they're still moving on to look at other candidates. He's desperate to get back in. You watched the video, right, where he started crying at the end and yeah. talk about how his family needs football. He's desperate to get back in. He desperately wants one of these jobs. Yeah. Um, Mike McCarthy's a great coach. Look, I don't care what anybody says about his patch. You go and look at his schedule, his record. It's playoffs after playoffs, playoff experience after playoff experience. The guy knows how to win football. I'm leery about his – I'm leery about – and he also, you know, I'm sure you've seen the rumors that he'd be willing to work with Elliot Wolf as his GM. Elliot Wolf is, seems – have made it through and he's still with us so that's an interesting possibility to me it's Josh McDaniels we have a little inside info Chase has actually seen it I don't always share with him everything I get but I <laughs> we know right Chase that one of his hand guys that's his hand-picked guys is supposedly a package deal with him wants to come to Cleveland and work uh, we know for a fact that Ziegler Dave Ziegler wants to come we have seen it with our own eyes, proof that he wants to be here. He's a Talmadge graduate, which is just outside of Akron. I actually lived in the area for a while. 1996 Talmadge graduate. He wants to come to Cleveland. We don't know if Josh wants to come to Cleveland for sure. We've heard rumors. Josina Anderson, who might be the most locked-in reporter in the league because all the players text her. <laughs> you know, she's constantly dropping. This guy just texted me. This guy just texted me. Said that he's ready to come back. And, and he, you know, Cleveland's one of the – he said Cleveland and Carolina are the two jobs he consider, and he's ready to coach down. He's, there's been – what Albert, Albert Breer reported now, she reported that he's actually assembling his staff behind the scenes. So it looks like uh, McDaniels is ready to be a coach. I think that's my leader in the clubhouse. I think McDaniels is the leader. You know, there's been multiple reports that the ownership love him. We already know the ownership loves the New England model. They love the organization in New England. So I think that's a leader in the clubhouse. I think the rest of these interviews are window dressing. Or backup contingency plans. It's obvious. Look what happened in the whole Chudzinski mess. Yeah. When we are after we fired Chudzinski, we ended up with Petten. We were completely unprepared because Lombardi had promised Harbaugh, right? So the Browns, I think, through back channels, and that's also through back channels, think they have McDaniel's and the boys, the John Carroll crew. Um, I think they think they have them. Look, the, how do you think? Remember Lombardi, and I, I don't know if you saw on Twitter, Lombardi was the first one to say he heard that not only was yeah, the coach is gone, but Dorsey's gone. He called. Well, who does who does Lombardi talk to? Patriots people. Patriots people. So I think that, and I've tried to get an answer, and I've been getting dicey. I've asked people in the league. I've asked, and I've tweeted at people in the league. Do does that go on? I'm sure it does. But do back channel stuff happen before the fact? You know what I mean? So behind the scenes, does Jimmy Haslam reach out to say McDaniel's agent or somebody like that to get an answer? Oh, uh, sure if he's campaign. interested. Right. That's what I mean. Does that go on? I'm sure it does. So I'm sure uh, my opinion is, and I could be way wrong. My opinion is there's already something behind the scenes done. They're going through the rest of this process in case it falls apart, which it has with the Daniels in the past, obviously with the Colts. Um, and, and it just in general happens 
where stuff falls apart in the NFL, right? Deals fall apart all the time. So you go through the process. You, you know, we know they like Stefanski. Uh, Mike McCarthy is a proven coach. So if and who's desperate to get back into the league. So if the McDaniels things were to fall apart, you have Stefanski, you have McCarthy, you have Slay, some decent contingency plans in a year where there's not 10 openings like there are, you know, what was there, eight openings last year? I mean, there's years where there's a ton of openings. This yeah. is not one of those years. So in a year when there's not as many openings, it looks like there's some decent candidates out there. Um, they do their due diligence. But in my opinion, McDaniels is the leader in the clubhouse and the Browns ownership wants him and has a, at least an inkling of an idea that he's interested. So that's uh, the coach that a couple weeks ago when I was clamoring for Freddie's firing that I was hoping it would get. Um, you know, it's interesting. We ha I, I posted a poll, Jay. I don't know if you saw this on Twitter. Uh, I was talking no, with my uh, best friend about these coaches. I, 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 I'm, I'm in love with Mike Vrabel. I think he's an awesome coach, and I, I yeah. wish we could take him. But I was asking him, and we thought – and we had this interesting discussion. Which of these head coaches has a higher ceiling as our head coach? I said – uh, McDaniel's, McCarthy, or McLovin, just to just to be dumb. Have you seen the results, Jay? I'm pulling it up right as we speak. Uh, seven oh, close to seven hundred Mc, votes. McDaniel's fifty six percent. Fifty six percent of McDaniel's. Uh, shouts to Tim has five kids. This is what he said. I think this captures the sentiment well. McCarthy is the safest bet. McDaniel's has the highest ceiling as everyone because he has that Belichick juju. I I think that's where people are landing. Are we? Are we dumb, Jay, for ignoring a Super Bowl winning quarterback who's who has coached a Hall of Fame quarterback and has a higher win percentage? I, I tweeted that. <coughs> Reed, I'm getting a huge Andy Reid in Kansas City vibes with, with with McCarthy here. Well, that would be. I mean, that's a great thing if that's the case. My, I guess my worry is. I mean, I like the fact that he admitted that maybe he had fallen behind a little bit in his last few years and he needed to, you know really attack the analytics side and really attack the new offensive side of the league. Um, but let's just hope he can. And like I said, I'm a little worried about this fossil of a coaching staff. He's put together a bunch of older guys. Um, that worries me a little bit. But, I mean, that all being said, he can come in and be great, right? He knows how to win. He knows what it takes to win. He's been a huge winner in the league. Um, there was rumors the team hated him, but then they showed that. Remember that all the rumors of the team hated him, but then he asked if he could talk to him one last time after he was fired and all the players were like, you know, it was like a big sad hug yeah. from everybody. So I'm I'm sure they didn't hate him as much as been reported after seeing that. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, he could be great. There's no doubt he could be great. Jade, talk to us about the the non sexy pick as far as name wise. Maybe the sexy pick looks wise. Stefanski. Where did he come from? Why is <laughs> he a, in the top Stefan three here? Are you saying Stefanski is the hottest choice for the coach? I mean, he looks good. I'm, I'm not ashamed <laughs> to say when someone looks good, man. He's good looking dude, yeah. Uh, Stefanski, well, a lot of people like Stefanski, and this is the scenario Stefanski. Um, Andrew Barry, who left here, he's with Philadelphia now, is actually a hot name or in league circles as the next, as a possible GM candidate all over the league, right? So the rumor is Depot obviously loves Barry. The ownership li really likes Barry as well. And they'd be happy to bring Barry back and pair him with Stefanski. And that's kind of like the analytics guy dream. Remember the story was that he got a second interview last year, if you remember. He's the only one besides Freddie and that Depot wanted Stefanski. Mm -hmm. So Stefanski is probably the sleeper. And I know the Jake Burns and the guys on Twitter that kind of analytics-driven guys that believe heavily in it love him. And his offense is tailor-made for Baker. It's what Baker should, been, should have been running. And you can incorporate two running backs into that offense. So they use zone running scheme. Hold on a sec. Chubb and Hunt both would fit perfectly in that running game. They run a lot under center. They run a ton of play action deep play action routes that we never run that drives me nuts a ton of move in the pocket a ton of boots um it's similar to shanahan it's similar to kyle shanahan offense and for those so, who don't know and Stefanski's that, in minnesota right he's the he's the offensive coordinator of the minnesota vikings yeah with Diggs and those guys that offense a lot of people have said throughout the year that that offense is tailor-made for baker mayfield he got um Jeez. what's his face all that money in washington right um uh, you like that? No, they they signed Kirk Cousins. Sorry, sorry, sorry. They signed Kirk Cousins. Right, but Kirk Cousins has been excellent. They made him look like a top three. three quarterback the first right, half yeah. of the season. I mean, yeah, you were all over his nuts with that, man. <laughs> I know what people are making. It's making me mad because people are like, oh, he's a bad. I'm like, do you don't want a quarterback that has 25 touchdowns and three interceptions, you know, yeah. 13 games in? <laughs> I'll take that all day long.
All right. So what does this mean for our players? Usually with a new GM and a new coach, there's a t- turnover and roster. I, I don't think that's right. what they're looking for here, Jay. Now, no, I, I, I do think a lot of the fringe guys will be affected big, depending on what system comes in. But our main guys are not going anywhere. I mean, Baker's not going anywhere. Chubb's not going anywhere. Hunt's probably not going anywhere. Odell and Jarvis aren't going anywhere. Uh, Miles Garrett's not going anywhere. Denzel Ward's not going anywhere. You know, the, the main cogs are not going anywhere. Uh, Show, now, guys like Showbird and Joku, you know, guys like that, we'll see. But Higgins? Um, it, I, I would think it, it, uh, Higgins is gone. You can forget it. Higgins is done. I, I try to tell everybody from the beginning, everybody that was in love with him, that he's at best a third receiver. Like, you don't lose sleep over a third receiver. But Cleveland, we get so attached to certain guys. But, yeah, Higgins is good as gone. And Joku, now, let me circle back to Njoku. Depending upon the coach, there's value in Njoku. He was a first-round pick. He's big, he's fast, he's strong. Something happened between him and Freddie. I don't know if you saw the video this week of, of him laughing, and then they asked him if, if Freddie was back, if he thought he'd be back, and he laughed. I they, for that. some reason – oh, it's incredible. I'll, I'll actually send it to you. Okay. Uh, it's an incredible. It was right before Freddie was fired. And uh, it's incredible. So something happened that we don't know about. I mean, I just don't understand. We talked about this so many times about how he was used at least as a decoy, and he made a ton of plays last year. I just don't understand not being able to incorporate him at all in the second half once he got back, whatever, though. So guys like that, though, fringe guys, of course, there's going to be big moves on the fringe guys, but I don't think you're going to see big moves in the core players, no. Yeah, Kirksky, do you, do you see uh, Christian Kirksky being back? If they let Schobert walk, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll probably give one more run of him if he can stay healthy, which he hasn't been healthy. We've talked about it uh, ad nauseum. Uh, when he's healthy, he's a really good player, but he's just never healthy. But if they save the money by letting Schobert walk, they may not cut him. I think that Hubbard's going to be gone because they can get out of his big contract this year. Um, I mean, can outside you of those guys, I mean, Treader's going to be back. Batonio's going to be back, obviously. Uh, I think they liked Wyatt Teller. He had a high – I don't know if you know, followed it on PFF, but he actually had high grades the second half of the year at that right guard. Mm-hmm. So I think they've kind of solidified the middle of the line. Um, they're going to have to worry. It's going to be – tack. It's, you know, the big thing this year is going to be safeties, defensive tackles, offensive tackles. I think because, you know, Larry Ogunjobi actually had a subpar year Yeah. when you look at his uh, rankings. I think they might look to upgrade him. Um, it's going to be D-line, safeties, and tackles is going to be the big focus this offseason. Another big focus as well, coaching, coach hirings, new uniforms, stadium announcements. Ooh. We are not going to be shy of content this offseason. No. Uh, Jay, we lose sleep over all of it, man. We're, we're Browns fans. Third wide receiver, fourth wide receiver. We lose sleep over everyone. Um, but uh, I want to give shouts to our presenting sponsors of the Lion Health Center and the place. The Lion Health Center is Northern Ohio's first chiropractic and biophysics clinic. The mission is simple to help people in West Lincoln Beach with areas achieve the best possible health and overall wellness. And also shouts to the place. The place is a full service fireplace spa superstore. The place has been in business for 52 years, all family owned and operated, transforming your backyard to the backyard of your dreams. When you think of fireplaces, hot tubs, grills, and patios, think the place. Shouts to the Lion Hall Center and the place for being with us all season long. You guys are the best. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, shouts to Online Motor Credit for sponsoring our Five Hot Minutes segment all season. You're going to hear a great episode all of our Five Hot Minutes segment after the weekend. Hopefully, get that up for you guys by Saturday night. Jeremy, any final thoughts, brother? No, but this, I mean... It's so funny, man, to sit here and think a year ago, and this is where we're at now. Uh, unbelievable. But like we've talked about since we started this show, there is never a dull moment. There is always something to talk about when you do a Cleveland Browns podcast, baby. That's right. Listen, we haven't at, at all talked about the draft, looked at the draft, where we haven't at all uh, done a kind of a season recap. We're going to try to get some people on, help us out with that. Jay, thanks for a wonderful night. Happy New Year, brother. And uh, it's great talking you. to you. Go Browns. Ooh, ooh. Say